I am excited to introduce Kale Williams. Kale is an award-winning journalist for the Oregonian Oregon Live, as well as the author, pull it up again, of The Loneliest Polar Bear, A True Story of Survival and Peril at the Edge of a Warming World. We're very excited to have you join us, Kale. Hello, I'm happy to be here. I will go ahead. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started with my presentation here. Uh, as Aaron said, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us on this very nice day outside. It has also been a week with a lot of heavy news. Uh, so I just like to acknowledge that it's been a heavy week and month and year. Uh, so we're here to talk about polar bears and climate change, which are also a heavy topic, uh, but we have lots of pictures of cute polar bears to help kind of balance things out. Uh, as Aaron said, I'm Kale Williams. I'm a reporter at the Oregonian and the author of The Loneliest Polar Bear, which is a book about Nora. That's Nora, uh, right about at 10 months old. And that's when I first met her. I was working at the Oregonian as a reporter. We got a press release that said the zoo was getting a new polar bear cub. And so editors thought, hey, that's a good story. I should head up there. So I went up and talked to the zookeepers and we found out that there were some pretty unique traits to Nora. Uh, she was born in Columbus, Ohio in November of 2015, uh, but she was abandoned by her mom when she was just about six days old. Uh, polar bears are almost completely helpless at this point. As you can see in the video, she weighed about 600 grams. Her mom for reference there, Aurora weighed about 600 pounds. Uh, and so when her mom walked out of the den and left her there, zookeepers only had a matter of hours to really decide whether to pull her from the den or not. You know, without her mother's heat, she probably would have frozen to death pretty quickly. So they pulled her out and began the very unique and challenging task of raising a polar bear by hand. Uh, few people in the world have ever done so successfully. Most of the time when they try to do something like this with a bear at that young of an age, uh, the bears don't make it. Uh, and one of the biggest issues is the formula. Uh, polar bear milk is about 30% fat. Uh, it's very, very rich. That's how they put on all the pounds that they need to survive in the Arctic. Uh, but when you're making that as a person, there's no real way to reproduce seal fat in polar bear milk. And so they had some problems early on getting a formula recipe that Nora would take to. And the first recipe that they tried, she wasn't absorbing a lot of the nutrients that polar bears are supposed to when they're young as their, their skeletons are developing. Uh, and she developed what was called metabolic bone disease. So some of her bones grew in crooked. She suffered some, some small fractures as a cub. They quickly changed her formula and it, it seemed like that kind of staved off the problem, but it would leave her with some lasting issues. Um, but as you can see, she grew and she developed. Uh, the polar bear keepers there taught her how to swim. Um, they taught her how to chase bubbles. So I'm getting a little distracted by this video because it's been a while since I've seen it. Um, but by the time she got to be about 60 or 70 pounds, uh, they could no longer be physically in the same space with her. She was just too big. She had sharp claws and teeth. And they knew that she was going to need a polar bear companion. I mean, there's only so much that a human can teach a polar bear. Uh, and so when she was about 10 months old, she moved to the Oregon Zoo. And that was mostly because they wanted her to meet Tossel. Uh, Tossel was a, uh, Tossel was a bear who had been at the Oregon Zoo for many years. She had recently lost her brother, Conrad. Um, I'm getting a little lost here in the slides. Uh, her brother Conrad had recently passed away and they thought she would be a great mentor for Nora. Uh, when she got to the zoo, Nora and Tossel didn't get along as well as the zookeepers had hoped. Um, and Tossel ended up passing away not long after Nora got there. So, and so she was alone again. But what really drew me into Nora's story was more of her origins. Um, you know, when we realized that she had been raised by humans and how rare this was, my editors at the Oregonian thought that there would be a good opportunity to look at her for a bigger piece. Um, and so my editor suggested that we track her lineage back to the last time any of her family members had been in the wild. 
And so I started asking the zookeepers about her mom. Her mom had been born in a zoo. Both of her mom's parents had been born in the zoo. But her father, a bear named Nanook, had actually been orphaned as a cub up in Alaska. Uh, and so I, I heard about that and didn't really know how I was going to go about figuring out the story behind that. Uh, so I got in contact with the Fish and Wildlife Service in Alaska, and they were able to dig up this press release from 1988. Um, might be a little hard for people to read, but essentially what this says is that Nanook was rescued after a native Alaskan hunter had been out hunting, fell through the roof of a polar bear den, killed the mother in self-defense, and then rescued the two cubs inside. Um, the, the, man, the hunter's name was Gene Agnabugok. There he is in 1988. Uh, and so we realized that there, were, there was a bigger story here with a connection to humans and climate change. This wasn't just a story about a cute bear in a zoo. So my editors uh, decided that I should go up to Alaska and see if I could meet Gene. He lives in a village called Wales. Uh, it's about 150 people on the very northwestern tip of Alaska. So I headed up there with a photographer from the Oregonian named Dave Killen. Um, I've got a video here about what that was like. Please excuse the dramatic music. I'll just let this go. Kayla, I don't think we can actually hear the music or any of the audio. Oh, well, sorry, what was that, Aaron? Oh, we can't hear the music. Uh, you've got it muted, oh, the video. Well, all right. Well, there was dramatic music there. <laughs> you guys can all imagine it. This is me and Dave arriving in Wales. Uh, we flew up there and we were pretty naive to what we were getting into. I mean, we knew we were going somewhere remote, uh, but we landed. The airstrip is probably about a quarter mile from where we were staying. We didn't have any way to get there. And thankfully, one of the people who lives in the village was nice enough to give us a ride on the back of their snowmobile, which was the footage that you just saw. Uh, this is Gene today. Um, that's him in the same house where he brought the two polar bear cubs back to uh, after he rescued them from the den. Uh, and... These two bears, Nanook and his brother Norton, would end up going to multiple different zoos all over the country. Nanook was at a zoo in Wisconsin and then at another one in Buffalo, New York, before he ended up in Columbus where he fathered Nora. Um, Wales is a, a very unique place. I mean, there are other villages like it in the northwest part of Alaska, but the people who live there, it's almost 100% Inupiaq. Uh, they've lived there for, you know, since time immemorial, and they've learned to survive in an environment that most of us would find inhospitable uh, over generations of learning and passing knowledge from one generation to the next. And so, you know, they know the, the migration patterns of all the different game animals that come by, walrus and whales, polar bears, caribou, moose. Uh, and they've learned that over generations, and all of that has been somewhat predicated on having a stable climate. Um, here's a picture of the bears uh, from the Nome Nugget soon after they were rescued in 1988. Uh, and there's Nora back in Oregon. Uh, so, you know, once I got up to Wales and started talking to Gene, that's when I realized that this story was much bigger than just Nora. Um, and I started thinking about how climate change tied in with all of these other facets. Uh, so, you know, I got back from Wales and I went out to Columbus to talk to some of the zookeepers there um, and started learning more about some of the struggles that Nora was facing. Uh, you know, she had the early problems when she was having trouble absorbing the nutrients but then when she got to Oregon, she started having more mental problems. Um, she was exhibiting what zookeepers call stereotypic behaviors. And that happens a lot to animals in captivity, especially large intelligent animals like polar bears. And what this looks like is when they have these repeated behaviors that have no obvious purpose. And so when you see animals pacing or you know knocking the same ball back and forth or swimming in laps or sometimes chewing on their paws or you know licking their fur until they have bald spots that's often a sign of anxiety and depression um, 
And zookeepers were seeing that in Nora soon after she arrived in Oregon. They think that it might be because she was so used to her keepers from Columbus that when they left, she suffered from some separation anxiety. So they ended up uh, putting on her on some medications, uh, some sort of longer term SSRIs, some antidepressants and some shorter term anxiety drugs, uh, the generic version of Xanax uh, for polar bears. And so, you know, here, here's Nora and Tossel when they met each other going back a little bit. Sorry, my slides got a little bit out of order here. I'm not sure quite what happened. But this is Nora and Tossel when they met each other. And as you can see, they did not get quite get along. Nora was a little bit scared of Tossel. And they think that that may have exacerbated some of her anxiety as well. Uh, but after Tossel passed away, Nora was all alone. And so they had to figure out ways to sort of teach her the, the patience that mother bears typically teach younger bears. And they did this by what they called Zen sessions. And this was where they would have Nora come up to one of the doors behind the scenes uh, and they would slowly feed her fish and they would increase the intervals between the fish and see how long she could go before she would get frustrated. And you know, as they went, she was eventually able to spend more and more time between fish where she would, you know, kind of keep her cool. But there still is only so much that that can do towards socializing an animal that's supposed to be learning from another bear of its own species. And so eventually it was decided that Nora would be moved again, um, this time to Salt Lake City where at the Hogel Zoo, where there was another bear that was just about her age. Um, and the two of them were paired up and they actually got along really well. It took a little while, but eventually they were able to form a bit of a relationship. It wasn't really a friendship because, you know, that's not really how wild animals operate, but they were able to form a bond where the two of them got along. Nora wasn't showing any signs of fear. The other bear, Hope, was very patient with her. Uh, the zookeepers there told me that she at one point came over and sort of picked up a toy and dropped it at Nora's feet. Um, sort of as a peace offering. And the two of them got along really well, uh, as would become sort of a repeating pattern in Nora's life. Uh, she hit another roadblock. In January of 2019, uh, her zookeepers arrived at the zoo to find her suffering from a broken leg. She had broken her humerus, which is one of the larger weight bearing bones. Um, and she required a first of its kind surgery. Uh, they actually flew in uh, an orthopedic surg veterinary surgeon from Texas A&M who's used to operating on young horses and inserted a rod into her leg. Uh, she had to go into physical therapy for eight or nine months, um, but eventually ended up doing just, just about as well as one can hope for having a first of its kind surgery. Her, her keepers tell me that, you know, she'll never be 100%, but she's about as good as you can expect. Um, they don't think that her early metabolic bone disease issues had anything to do with the break, but she does still walk with kind of a bulldog stance, and they think that she's going to have some arthritis at an earlier age than would be expected for a bear of her kind. Um, and so the larger takeaway, I think, from Nora's story is not that, you know, bears are good or bad, or polar bears, you know, should be the face of climate change. But I really think it's a story about connection. And that's what I heard from the folks that I talked to up in Wales. Uh, polar bears have been kind of, you know, put on a pedestal as the poster child of climate change. But their status is a little more nuanced than they are going to die because the earth is getting warmer. There's 19 subpopulations of polar bear in the Arctic. Uh, and some of them are definitely on the decline, especially the, some of the southern populations. But some of them are not. Some of them are stable. Some of them are thought to be growing. And so when you appoint an animal like the polar bear to be your poster child, and then you have some populations that are growing, it gives folks who are inclined to argue in bad faith that climate change is not a problem an opportunity to say, well, you say polar bears are dying, but look at this population is doing fine. And so it, it's, it's difficult. There are pros and cons to having them as, as the face of climate change. I mean, if, if 
seeing a polar bear in a zoo is what inspires people to action, then by all means, I think that's a great thing. Whatever gets people to act on this very dramatic pressing problem that we have. But if it gives people an opportunity to sort of shut down your argument, then you've sort of lost the benefit there. Um, and there have actually, there's niche groups of climate deniers that focus specifically on polar bears. Uh, there's a blog called Polar Bear Science, completely unironically, that's run by a woman who specializes in more or less just trolling polar bear researchers, uh, calling them names, calling all of their research bullshit. Uh, so, you know, for a problem that's as big and nuanced as climate change, having one figurehead like that, it's problematic. Um, but getting back to the, the connective issue uh, between places like Wales and places like Oregon, where I live, you know, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet and polar bears and the people who live there have learned to do so predicated on a stable climate. I mean, that's how polar bears have adapted to be these amazing swimmers. That's how people like Jean have learned to hunt in these places that are covered in ice for most of the year. And so when the climate changes, even just a little bit, the migration patterns for game animals change. And the amount of sea ice that there is for polar bears to use as a platform to hunt seals, the only animals that can really sustain them, when that changes, then everything goes haywire. And when stuff like that happens, it's not the people with the most among us that suffer, it's the people with the least. Uh, and that was, I think, evident here in Oregon, just over the last few months, we had a, a crazy ice storm here that knocked out power to half a million people. And for those of us who had the means to go stay in a hotel, then that was fine. But if you didn't, then you're stuck in your house without heat or light for two weeks for some people. And so it really, it really comes down for me to being a moral issue. For, for those of us who have the means to act on this, to, to change, our daily patterns and habits uh, to shrink our carbon footprint. We should do that. But the problem is beyond the scope of individual action at this point. We've reached a point where the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are such that change needs to happen on a systemic scale. Uh, and the only way that that can happen is through big governmental action. Um, one of the people that I talked to for this book helped, uh, he was a senior science advisor for Obama when they were crafting the Paris Climate Accord. And I was talking to him and I asked him, you know, what needs to happen for real meaningful change to come about? And he said, we're kind of beyond the point where we need to be convincing people. We've got a majority of people that believe that this problem is real. They know that humans have caused it. Uh, but that group of people who are believers need to prioritize uh, climate. You know, it's, it's one of these problems that is so interconnected to everything else that, you know, if we don't put climate as a priority, it's going to make everything else harder from transportation to immigration to military action. I mean, there are very few problems that won't be made worse by a change in climate that we're not prepared for. And there, there are a couple different ways to look at it. You know, there's mitigation. We need to drastically cut our carbon emissions. Um, and the fastest way to do that is going to be through sustainable energy sources. I mean, there are, there's a lot of talk recently about, you know, carbon capture and these technologies that will perhaps be able to to lessen the, the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, but they're a long ways off and they're still very expensive and we just don't have the time for that. Um, but we also need to adapt. We need to adapt to what's coming because ice storms like the one that rolled through Oregon, while that was not you know, directly attributable to climate change, things like that are going to become more common and they're going to happen more frequently. And so we need to be able to protect those of us who don't have the means to 
just drive over to a hotel when things like that happen. The, the fires that happened here last year, those are going to be more frequent. And, you know, you can just look at the last few weeks when it's been close to 80 degrees in Portland, when it's supposed to be raining buckets, you know, and it, it's hard not to imagine this going very poorly for a lot of people if we don't take meaningful action soon. And so, you know, for me, the story was not just about Nora and it wasn't just about Jean. It's not just about zookeepers and, you know, zoos and wild bears. It's about the connective tissue that sort of binds us all together. I mean, the, the people in Wales are not so different from people in rural Oregon. Uh, people in rural Oregon are not so different from those of us who live in the bigger population centers in the Willamette Valley. I mean, we all have different opinions and different politics. But climate change doesn't care about that. Climate change is going to affect us all. And so people have asked me often, you know, this book is very depressing. Uh, not this book, but climate change is very depressing. Where do you find hope? And I don't really see hope as a very useful idea when it comes to climate change. There's not exactly a lot of agency in hope. Hope is something that you employ when you buy a lottery ticket or, you know, are looking to avoid a lightning strike. I think a more important emotion to bring to climate change is anger. And I got that from some of the youth climate activists that I talked to when I was reporting this book. Uh, I talked to one young man named Isao Sunak, who's from a village right up the coast from Wales called Shishmaref. Uh, Shishmaref is on a barrier island and has been there for, you know, thousands of years protected from erosion by sea ice. But now that there is much less sea ice up there, they're seeing their beaches being eaten away. They've had to move houses away from the beachfront. Um, and they've actually recently voted to re relocate the whole village. And for people like that who are so tied to a place, even if you move everyone in the village to another place and call it Shishmaref, you know, the folks up there say that it's just, it's not going to be shish breath any, anymore. And so taking from him and from another young woman that I spoke to named Jamie Margolin, uh, they're angry. And I think anger is a much more productive emotion to bring to climate change because climate change didn't come about by accident. We've known that the climate is warming for decades since the 50s or 60s, some of the biggest polluters, the American Petroleum Institute and the companies they represent have scientists who have known that this problem is coming. And they've had a concerted effort to cast doubt on science that was more or less certain. Um, so if you think about it in that context and you come at it with a sense of anger and indignation, I think that it's easier to put this as a priority than it might be if you just think that, you know, you can buy a Prius or bike to work, which you should do, but that alone is not going to do it. And if, if anger gets you closer to, you know, demanding action from your ele elected representatives, I think that serves a much better purpose than hope. Um, I think that that's enough of me talking for now. Uh, if Danielle wants to, to chime back in um, and get on get on your soapbox for a little bit uh, and then we'll answer some questions. Sounds good, thank you so much. So let me, um, let's just have, yes, I do want it. Sorry, takes me a minute to screen the whole thing here. Um, oh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, you're my audience, Kale. <laughs> Otherwise the audience can't tell. Um, Great. So I, obviously, Aaron uh, mentioned I'm Danielle Moser. I'm the Wildlife Program Coordinator for Oregon Wild. Um, and thanks again for everyone joining us and Kale joining us tonight. Um, obviously, Aaron talked about what our organization is. But again, we're just a statewide conservation organization. Um, I specifically work on our wildlife program. Um, so I'm going to do a quick overview of our program itself and just especially if you're new to Oregon Wild, um, getting a sense of what we do and how and why we do it. Um, and then I'll talk about the nexus of wildlife and climate change. Um, am I doing this right? Okay, here we go. So um, 
you know, often when I tell people I'm a wildlife uh, program coordinator or wildlife coordinator, a lot of people think I'm a biologist or an ecologist and I'm out in the field and I'm tracking animals and doing all that fun stuff that sounds really amazing. Um, but I, I in Oregon Wild and our program is much more focused on, on advocacy and on ensuring that we have better policies in place that are going to protect and restore all of our species in Oregon and their habitat. So that's much more of my focus and Oregon Wild's focus. Um, and we often are advocating in lots of different spaces, but the most common ones are you know, within the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife um, and their commission. Um, you know, I think this is often a place that gets forgotten when we think about where policies are made. We think about legislatures and Congress and sometimes the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, but really when it comes to state level policy, the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission is really where a lot of um, decisions are made. And so um, we spend a lot of time, you can see the picture of some activists in front of the commission uh, relating to a wolf hearing a few years ago. Um, we do obviously spend time in Salem. Well, nobody spends time anywhere, anywhere these days, but historically we would be in Salem um, working on both trying to pass better legislation uh, that protects species. And then of course, stopping really bad legislation, which we do a lot. Um, and then it, at the federal level in front of Congress and with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And again, you know, I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about that administrative policy that gets made, but that's really important. And in fact, you know, the US Fish and Wildlife Service is who recently delisted wolves from the endangered species list. So just thinking of all these different ways that impact wildlife and conservation um, efforts. So then within the program, um, within our wildlife program, you know, I'd like to give people a big sense of a better sense of what we work on and, and why and how. Um, you know, I'm the only one, the full time staffer that works on wildlife for Oregon Wild. And so my time is limited. We have, you know, limited resources. So uh, there's so many species and habitats, of course, that I could work on, but it's sort of this how, how do we choose what we do? Um, and so I call it the conservation of the keystones. And what I mean by that is, and perhaps you've heard of this term of an ecological keystone species, which, you know, is, an, is a species that has an overwhelming um, uh, benefit to its surrounding environment. So usually without that keystone species, you see ecosystem collapse, you see um, dysfunction, you see a, sort of a lack of, um, uh, of just, like I said, full function within that ecosystem. And so a keystone species really brings it all together and makes sure all the parts are working correctly. And so um, obviously we work on species that are ecological keystone, keystone species and especially, especially those that are imperiled on decline, you know, in need of recovery. But the, the other two things that I think are a little bit new, but I really think about it in this, this way a lot is a political keystone species and a social keystone species. And so what I mean by that with political keystone species is, um, you know, we obviously care for that individual species sake, um, wanting to see, you know, it be recovered or thrive. Um, but there are certain species that, you know, whether it's because of their habitat or other issues connected to uh, different special interests or extractive industries, it really helps us elevate um, a lot of connected issues to that species. And so what I mean by that is, um, for example, that bird at the bottom of the screen is a marbled merlet. Um, it is a rare nesting seabird that forages for fish in the ocean and it nests in old growth forests along the coast. And so just, you know, it's been in decline for many years and there's an effort underway to seek more protections for this bird. Um, but why in my mind, it's also a political keystone species is because of that connection to it nesting in old growth forest. And so it brings out another opportunity to talk about this connection to habitat and forest practices and logging. And so it's, you know, it's an important species on its own, but then it has a bigger political context um, to seeking protections for it. And then finally, we have a social keystone species. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I can't do the work that I do as an advocate without the support of the public and without the community, you know, elevating these issues, talking to your legislators, testifying in front of the commission. And so we often choose species, not because we care anymore, but that species that are going to get people fired up um, and want to be active. And so, you know, while I would love to think that everybody would wake up in the morning and say, oh my gosh, I want to go fight for the red tree vole, which maybe some of you do, and that's great. 
Uh, the fact of the matter is there's certain charismatic species that get people really motivated, like wolves, sea otters, beaver. Um, and so those are species that we consider these social keystone species. And so obviously a lot of the different animals can fit into one of the categories or all three, often a lot of them fit into all three. Uh, but that's just, I wanted to give people a sense of, you know, why and how do I choose what I work on with Oregon Wilds? And that's, that's kind of that breakdown. Okay, so now getting into the actual topic at hand here. And, you know, it's interesting because when I was thinking about like, okay, Kale's going to talk about this and it's going to feel very doom and gloom, like, how can I end on hope? And now it's kind of funny, you're, you're talking about the, the hope from that perspective, because I, I agree, I actually think anger is a much better way to get people motivated. Um, but I want to give you at least a glimmer of hope in the sense that there are things that we could be advocating for in the wildlife space um, to fight climate change. And so while obviously the extinction crisis coupled with climate change are devastating some species more than others, there's actually certain species and the recovery of those species can really aid and be natural allies in the fight against climate change. And so that's actually what I wanna talk about this evening um, is our work to actually support species that can help us mitigate some of those effects and help us better adapt. Um, and so as you can see in the picture, it's sea otters and it's beavers. So going to sea otters first. Um, and if you don't know the history of sea otters, I suggest you check out our uh, Oregon Wild. We have a whole page on it. We did a whole podcast series and we have lots of webcasts on it. But basically the history of sea otters in this state is that they were here for millennia. Um, and then due to the international fur trade and you know just over hunting and trapping, we extirpated the species um, from, our, from our state. And there was one attempt to reintroduce the species back to the Oregon coast um, in the 70s. It didn't take. Um, so for all intents and purposes, we have no sea otters in Oregon, despite the fact that Washington, Alaska, and California have sea otters. Um, and why this species is incredibly important and a missing link is, and I think you can see it in this picture, is that connection with predator prey um, and the fact that sea otters help keep urchin in check. And as a result, because urchin are these herbivorous uh, you know, creatures that just really decimate kelp population, kelp forests, um, by having sea otters back in the seascape, it keeps that balance. And so the urchin population is kept in check, letting kelp forests be able to thrive. And there's huge benefits to, the, to kelp and having kelp forests. Um, one, and this is the connection of course to climate change is the carbon sequestration uh, possibility, potential. Um, kelp provide important habitat, food, shelter um, for a number of species. And it also reduces coastal erosion by uh, buffering waves and currents um, in the near shore. So there's a number of benefits to kelp um, and more and more studies are being done, but I actually saw one relatively recently that said the potential to sequester carbon in kelp might actually be greater than a lot of forests even on land. Um, so that's why this is an important species. And again, this sort of this idea of a missing link um, and this missing keystone species. So that's um, one particular animal that we're working to help bring back and restore on our Oregon coast. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the other one is the state animal, the beaver. Um, and it's an incredible species. And it's not imperiled necessarily in the state, but we have over the years, you know, we have a different perspective, I think, on beaver than we need to have, which is, um, you know, they're actually classified on private land as a nuisance species, as a predatory species. And so, you know, hunting and trapping are limitless. You don't even need a permit to do that on private land. Um, and then beaver on public land are considered fur bearers. And so, just understanding these classifications gives you a sense that we don't value it. Um, we're not really studying it. We're not researching. We're not understanding what is the potential with beaver. Um, and that to me is a huge, huge missed opportunity, um, especially when we're talking about climate change. And, you know, Kale talked about, especially the increased intensity of wildfires and, and, and droughts and all of these things that are coming from climate change. And so as wildlife advocates, we are screaming from the rooftops, we need to be restoring beaver population. We need to be actually strategically thinking about how to help 
um, bring back beaver in key areas, especially as it relates uh, to drought and wildfire. So I'm gonna um, get out of this screen real quick and show you, um, oh, that's not what I wanted to do, um, and show you this really cool video about the impact and the potential of beaver, especially in creating um, fire breaks. So. So I just, I think that was a great video to capture what we're, when we're talking about um, beaver and the potential and as ecosystem engineers. And I, you know, I think that gets thrown out a lot. You know, we hear, oh, beaver, they can help with drought and, you know, this and that. But I think really understanding what they do in helping restore and clean uh, water, you know, um, it's just, it's real. it can be really impactful, but we have to really direct our efforts to better understanding how to work with this species as a natural ally. And, you know, there's gonna be lots of technology and lots of ways that we are going to invest in helping our communities and our environment mitigate and also adapt to climate change. But I, this is, I wanna showcase that we actually have allies in nature that are supposed to be there to really help make our ecosystems and uh, more resilient. So um, I'll stop there. And I know my presentation was quite quick and I, did a pretty big overview, but if you do have any questions um, after this presentation, don't hesitate um, to reach out. So that's what I got. I think Aaron's gonna join us for the Q&A. Maybe. Are you there, Aaron? All right, thank you both. And, and Daniel. Can people hear me or did I lose my, oh, there we go. Might be a delay. Oh, we can't hear I'm you. getting that nice warning system that might be about you um, I'll just jump right into Q and A and hope people can hear me at this point. I can hear um, you. <laughs> okay, great reassurance. Um, and folks, feel feel free to to add um, uh, more questions, and I'll organize them uh, as they come in. Oh. But uh, the first one uh, is directed to you, Kale. Um, I remember a story you wrote about an elephant seal that blocked a Bay Area highway. Uh, is that when you got hooked writing about wildlife? It is. Uh, so this was back in, I think it was 2016, maybe 2015. Uh, there was an elephant seal that uh, crawled out of the Bay. <clears throat> it was way outside of where it was supposed to be and was blocking a highway in the Northern part of the Bay Area. Uh, so my editor sent me up there and, you know, I just kind of cataloged this, uh, the efforts of some folks from the Marine Mammal Center who came out to try to herd this 800 pound elephant seal back into the bay. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And eventually they were able to do so. But what struck me about reporting on that was, you know, when you're a reporter writing about humans, you know, you, you have to take a step back. You don't wanna take a side. You wanna make sure that everybody is treated fairly. If there's somebody that disagrees with somebody else, you know, there's this old kind of antiquated notion of objectivity. Uh, but for an animal, you can pretty openly root for their success. Uh, you do not have to be objective about animals. Um, and, you know, there, there might be some people out there 
who are rooting against them, but those people can just go after themselves, to be quite honest. I mean, I think that's one of the joys about, you know, the, the, the wild natural world is that it doesn't need us to exist. Uh, the natural world was here before we were, it will be here after we are. Um, and, you know, our, our human problems, our, our conflicts and our interpersonal struggles mean very little in the larger picture of things. Um, obviously, when our struggles relate to climate change and how we're changing the planet, they have a much bigger impact than, than any of us as a single person. But yes, to get back to the question, that is how I got hooked on writing about animals. I'll try not to go too far down that rabbit hole. <laughs> um, you, you talked about life in Wales. Um, well, you talked about how things were changing in the, the village of Shishbarath. Um, or, or something that, that kind of sounds like what, what I said. Um, but how has life changed in Wales for the people that are living there um, as, as you, you know, the, the climate has become less reliable for them? Sure. Uh, so Wales is not on the road system. Uh, you can only get there by airplane or by boat, uh, and few people travel there by boat. The waters are a little bit treacherous. Uh, so people there have traditionally made their living off subsistence hunting. Uh, they hunt, they've gotten really good at preserving meat. Um, you know, there's some evidence that, that folks from far Northern latitudes have some different genetic traits that make them able to process high fat foods like whale blubber and seal blubber and they need fewer vegetables. Um, but food is very expensive there. So when you buy food in the stores, it's like $20 for a sack of sugar and you know, like $10 for a gallon of gas. And so when they have more trouble hunting because the climate conditions are changing, that means that they need to buy more food in the store. And there are not a lot of economic opportunities up there. I mean, by traditional Western standards of you know, the poverty line, lots of people up there are very poor, but that hasn't really mattered in the past because they've been able to make their living hunting and fishing and trapping game. And so as the climate changes, it's just getting more expensive to live there and their, their economic opportunities aren't increasing. And so, you know, people are leaving these villages and, you know, the folks up there, when I asked them, you know, are, are you worried about climate change? They say, no, we've adapted before, we can adapt again, but there, there's only so much adaptation that I think folks in those situations can do before they just have to up and leave. Um, so, I mean, they still hunt, they still fish, they're still getting by that way, but it's unclear how much longer that's going to be sustainable. Um, one question, I've heard that retaining more water, and this is probably in, in regards to the, the beaver presentation, uh, more water on land is as important, if not more important than reducing carbon in the atmosphere. Can you comment on that? And I haven't, I haven't heard about that as being, I mean, obviously climate change is going to change the amount of water and where it is. Um, yeah, I'm going to punt that to Danielle. I'm going to punt that to everybody else. I, I don't, I, I've not heard that. So I don't, I'm not, I don't have a good comment to add to that. Sorry. Personally. Yeah, that, that's new to me, but it sounds interesting. Yeah. There, um, they mean in the soil? I like, mean, obviously. Uh, oh, it just—it it just reminded me that you know when we started developing, especially the Southwest and going over into Southern California, you know, we remade, and this this is in evidence in Southern Oregon right now. You know, we we redirected rivers, we changed how the entire system works. Um, and that has consequences as, you know, we've gone through a wetter, cooler period. Um, we're coming back into a hotter, drier period as the climate's changing, that's accelerating changes. Um, but it always reminds me of a story I read in um, uh, Cadillac Desert that they were trying to develop the West and especially the Southwest. And they would say, rain follows the plow. And people would literally, they literally thought that like shaking the atmosphere. I think you talk about this in your book, Kale, a little bit. Um, yeah. Like the 
shaking particles in the atmosphere uh, brings rain and people just throw dynamite into the air and uh, hope that that was going to bring more rain because it would be shaking the particles. Um, so I got to do a tangent, not you can on this <laughs> one. Um, uh, as Nora aged, but before she moved to Portland, um, did she recognize and play with her caregivers? Um, and and as, a, as an extension of that, I noticed in some of the pictures you had that the polar bears had like big, like Kong-like plastic toys. Does that, um, does that replicate some in the natural world? Like do bears, do polar bears some play? Uh, so I, I don't think they're really clear on whether she recognized any of her keepers. I think to know that you would have to get inside the mind of a polar bear, uh, which is impossible to do. And, you know, I, I've sort of asked questions that nibble around those edges and keepers have, you know, sort of warned me about anthropomorphizing too much. You know, you don't want to put human emotions onto an animal because they experience things in a way that we're never really going to understand. Um, I think that, you know, she, polar bears primarily operate with their sense of smell. And I think that she probably recognized the smells of her habitat and keepers in Ohio. And that may have been why she started suffering from anxiety uh, when she was brought here to Oregon because everything was new and different and she was being introduced to this much larger animal. Um, but in terms of the toys, uh, they use, they call them enrichment in the zoo world, and they use those to keep their minds active. It's one of the ways that they, they stave off some of these stereotypic behaviors. They will freeze fish into blocks of ice so that the bears can bat them around, or some people might, you know, be familiar with dog toys where the treat is hidden inside and the dog has to solve a sort of puzzle to get it out. They have a lot of things like that. Uh, that they give to polar bears. Uh, they try to switch up their their regimen every day so that they're not you know, doing the same thing at the same time every day so that they don't get settled into a pattern because that can lead to sort of these, these stereotypic behaviors. And so they use enrichment to sort of keep their minds active uh, and sort of switch it up so that they're not just doing the same thing over and over every day. Um, you said nibble around the edges. Did was Nora ever aggressive with any of her handlers? Oh, <laughs> I was speaking metaphorically in that I was having questions that sort of nibbled around the the edges of the idea of polar bears having what might resemble human emotions. Uh, she was never really aggressive. Uh, they sort of got out of the pen with her before she was old enough to be so. But I mean, she does have polar bear claws, which are big and polar bear teeth, which are sharp. And so even if she wasn't intending to be aggressive with them, you know, once she got to be 60 or 70 pounds, she could hurt them inadvertently very easily. But from what I know, she never, um, never nibbled around the edges of any of her keepers. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Um, a few questions for you on otters, Danielle. Um, why they uh, aren't in Oregon? So what's maybe some of the reasons about what's what's either prevented their return or prevented the um, their uh, them flourishing after they were not reintroduced, translocated. Um, it wasn't really a reintroduction re effort. Uh, and then. Um, a little bit about the sea urchins um, that they're keeping in check. What are what are the, the conditions of the kelp, kelp beds since the sea urchins are uh, there and quite ravenous? Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to think of, I could talk about sea otters since I've done a few webcasts about that, but um, essentially, uh, well, they were doing nuclear bomb testing in, in Alaska uh, um, on an island called Mchipka Island. And so as Aaron pointed out, there wasn't really a reintroduction effort in the late 60s and early 70s. It was much more, hey, maybe we could save some of these otters from being blown to bits by just relocating them. 
oh, they used to be in Washington and Oregon and parts of California. Let's let's do that. And so there wasn't a ton of as whereas when we think about a reintroduction effort now, I mean, there would be economic analysis, environmental analysis, you know, all these different scientific components and social components that would go into it before reintroduce, reintroducing that didn't that didn't happen then it was just okay let's you know take 50 individuals and drop them off at the shore um we don't really know why it didn't take uh, there's lots of theories and people have tried to dive into it but the fact of the matter is um we don't really know um it took in washington you know there's some question of just was it the you know right time of year, right combination of juveniles to males to females? Um, was it the right subspecies? Did they need a combination of northern and southern? So there's a lot of questions out there, and because it wasn't a very like well monitored uh, effort, uh, there's just a lot of holes in our understanding. However, there are efforts underway right now. Um, to do what I was talking about before we do a reintroduction. They're looking at, you know, is this economically feasible? Is it scientifically, you know, and environmentally and ecologically feasible? What would it take? What does it look like? Um, understanding all of those components. So that's kind of what's undergoing right now. Um, the other piece, whereas when wolves were reintrodu reintroduced into Yellowstone in Northern Idaho, for example, wolves disperse long distances. And so, um, it wasn't a surprise that wolves wound up in, in Oregon crossing hundreds of miles. The difference with sea otters is they don't disperse very far. So that's why sort of waiting for this natural um, repopulation to happen in Oregon is just, it's really unlikely. Um, and often, you know, we'll have a stranded come down from Washington every now and again, but often not alive um, and they're very rare. So um, just to give you a sense of the why we're not just sitting here crossing our fingers that otters would come up from California or down from Washington. Um, and then, sorry, the second part was just about the inner, the interplay of kelp and urchin. Yeah. Yeah. So um, OSU and, and some other, there's a specific um, extension office in Port Orford. They're doing a lot of diving efforts to really assess, you know, this, the state of kale, um, uh, kale, excuse me, kelp. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> yes, what is the state of kale? Um, the state of kelp. And, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is they, there's two factors, the missing sea otters and um, uh, Pycnopodia, the, the sea star um, and issues around that. And that's kind of what's causing the decline in kelp and why we're seeing these urchin barons. And so, um, yeah, there's more and more analysis being done, but the fact of the matter is we know that kelp is nowhere near what it used to be. And we've seen time-lapsed photos of what it used to be historically and where we are now. So, and the major missing component is sea otters. Sorry, that was a little convoluted, but I think I got there. <laughs> uh, and uh, back to kale, um, what, what's the current, you talked about some populations of polar bears were stable, some were declining, um, and some might be growing. What's our best estimate on uh, statistics, or are there hard statistics on the the current health of the overall polar bear population? Sure. So they think roughly that there's about twenty six thousand polar bears, uh, give or take five or 10,000 in either direction. They are enormously hard animals to study. Like I said, there's 19 subpopulations um, and some of them are too remote for them to have any estimates at all. Uh, the other ones where they think they're growing or stable or going down, some of that research is 10 or 20 years old. Uh, but they do, given the, you know, the power of climate modeling these days and what they know about sea ice, uh, they think that many of those subpopulations are going to go into reproductive failure by the middle of the century if things continue on the trajectory that we're on now and that you know polar bears will be all but extirpated from 80 percent of their range by the end of the century with just a small population remaining in kind of the canadian arctic archipelago uh so up in those islands around greenland uh the outlook is not great 
uh, for them as a species on the long term. And, you know, I think people picked up some uh, some subtext uh, uh, from, from your presentation, but what's your overall impression of zoos both as a as a as a educational tool as a tool for activism and learning um uh, either yeah uh this is a hard question for me to answer and it's this is not the first time i've been asked it and it sort of depends on you know what kind of reporting i've done most recently i mean if you think strictly about the welfare of the animals in zoos it's hard to argue that that's the best place for them. I mean, you see the stereotypic behaviors. Uh, animals like polar bears are in something like, you know, a millionth of the range that they would have in the wild. These animals can, you know, swim a hundred miles in a matter of days very easily in the wild. And, you know, they're in places that are a quarter to a third of an acre in most zoos. Um, you know, you see elephants and, you know, killer whales and dolphins exhibiting behaviors that they would never see in the wild, probably just because they're bored. So if you look at it strictly that way, it's hard to argue that zoos are good places for animals. Now, if you talk to people in zoos, they'll tell you that they have come a long way since the bad old days of zoos, when zoos were just there as attractions and the animal, animal welfare was kind of an afterthought. You know, they have dedicated veterinary staffs. And beyond that, they, use kind of the the revenue that they make off animals like Nora or elephants or primates to fund like at the Oregon Zoo they have a California condor conservation program and nobody's buying tickets to go see California condors because they are very important animals but they are ugly ass birds uh no one is going to pay for the western pond turtles that they're working to save up there or you know the silver spot butterflies all of these endangered species that are from Oregon that need to be saved, but are not exactly going to get people through the gates. And so, you know, the zoos will tell you that they have these conservation programs. And beyond that, they forge connections between people and animals that people would otherwise have no opportunity to do so. Most people are never going to see a polar bear in the wild or an elephant in the wild or a giraffe in the wild. And so if people are able to see these animals and think about, you know, Nora's wild cousins who are facing this bleak future, perhaps they will be motivated to go home and take more action than they would have been otherwise. Now, granted, that is a very hard thing to measure. And obviously it is in the zoo's self-interest to make that argument because that can sort of fend off the animal welfare argument. Um, so to get back to your question, I mean, it's a tough, it's, it's kind of up to your own ethical scale. If you put more weight on the side of the animal's welfare, then zoos are not going to be a place that you look upon favorably. If you put more weight on the conservation work that they're doing and, you know, the, the theoretical inspiration that they're able to provide, then obviously you're going to come down on the other side. And, and for me, I've gone back and forth a lot uh, if I'm at a zoo and I see you know, a tiger pacing back and forth in its cage, it's, it's gonna be sad. I saw that, you know, and it was immediately obvious that this cat was bored and not in a great state of mind. Um, but I also got emails after the series came out that the book was based on from people who said that they visited Tossel 20 years ago at the Oregon Zoo and now they're, they became a wildlife biologist. So, I mean, that's a long way of not answering your question, but, I think that it's kind of an individual decision that each person needs to, to make ethically. Actually, I think that's a really good answer to that question. Um, I, Danielle's nodding. Um, well, I was laughing because you described a social keystone species. I mean, right? Like, how do you build connection for people to these animals? And you all should care about Western pond turtles. So anyway, that's another one. <laughs> and red tree poles. Um, well, I think that's going to do it for, for this presentation. Kale, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, do you have any last uh, thoughts where people should pick up your book, read your other work? Uh, 
you can read the series that the book was based on. Uh, it is, goes by the same title. Uh, you can pick up the book. I would encourage you to do so at Powell's or Broadway Books through IndieBound or Bookshop, or if you absolutely must, through Amazon. Uh, my work is available through the Oregonian Oregon Live, often in the paper, always on the internet. Uh, and if you're able, I would encourage you to subscribe to whatever your local newspaper is. That's a great uh, action to end on because uh, educating people about our changing climate um, and actions that can happen and things that can impact that and our, our natural world, our built environment. Um, a lot of that information comes through your local papers. So um, check out Kale's book, uh, subscribe to your local paper. And uh, Danielle, why don't you leave us on an inspirational note? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, Let's harness this energy into some great action to sign up with Oregon Wild. If you haven't already, we have a wolves and wildlife specific listserv where I tell you all the times you can testify in front of the commission or at the legislature. So do that and turn hope and anger into action. <laughs> great. All right. Thanks, everyone.